Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews with Christopher Brown. I am your host, and I am pleased and honored to have our guest on to the show today. But before I introduce them, I want to make a special mention that I am joined by our co-host of our other show, The Political Trenches, Local Government at Work. Ian McCormick is here with me. Ian, thank you so much for being my co-host for this special interview today. You're welcome. Nice to be here again, Chris. So our two guests today, uh, I'm, this is kind of a weird introduction for me, but I want to word it correctly. They will be out of a job, their current elected job, on January 1st, 2023, when their two communities become one in the new incorporated town of Diamond Valley. To join, to join myself and Ian is the current mayor of Turner Valley, His Worship, Barry Crane, and the current mayor of Black Diamond, His Worship, Brendan Kelly. Brendan, Barry, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having us, Chris. Thank you very much for having us on today, Chris. So before we get into the nitty gritty about the new town of uh, Diamond Valley, I have asked every single political candidate or political uh, uh, elected official the exact same question to start off all my interviews. And you two are no exception to that. So I'm going to start with Barry first. Barry, where'd your sense of duty to serve come from? Oh, well, that's an easy one. Uh, uh, from Newfoundland. <laughs> uh, growing up in small town Newfoundland, everybody throws in and helps everybody. That's just the way things are done. Uh, so my uh, father, Bill Crane, uh, set a great example for me as a volunteer, minor hockey, Lions Club, Kinsman, uh, everything. You name it, golf club. He helped build a golf club in town. So uh, I was dragged along to a lot of things and uh, sports, of course lots of volunteering in sports. So for me, it was just a matter of where I live contributing back. So here's where I got uh, situated. Uh, we love it here. We moved out here, got two small, well, not small kids anymore. They were small back then, but uh, the people of the town, just everything resonated and we planted roots. And now what about yourself, uh, Brendan? Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Yeah, mine, uh, mine actually doesn't uh, start too far off from the rock because uh, I split a lot of my childhood in New Brunswick uh, and my grandfather was a court judge uh, and growing up I had this, um, you know, I was, I was fascinated by law and politics. I still have a lot of family out east uh, that is involved with the liberals, the conservatives, um, a lot of them are still acting um, MLAs right now and uh, so that's where things initially started off. And, and just like uh, Barry had, had said, the, the fruit doesn't fall too far from the tree. So um, with it being family, um, my dad was an educator and he coached, he volunteered. Uh, we were very involved in the church, uh, raised Catholic. And so there was always that um, almost like a perceived duty that on the weekends you would volunteer some of your time, you know, whether it be an altar boy or uh, after church, you'd go over and you'd help an elderly resident move furniture or move from house to house. So I knew that at some point I'd be getting involved and uh, I thought I'd get involved a little bit closer to Barry's age. Cause like he alluded to, he's got some preteen teenage kids. Now I've got a six and a three year old. Um, but what threw a wrench into my plans was COVID. And, uh, what ended up happening at the end of the day is I, I looked at my wife and I said, I don't want to wait in the event that anything happens. You know, the community needed uh, a little bit of a bright spark last year. And so I got involved and, uh, I, I love it. Absolutely love it. I'm a teacher full time and that's what keeps the lights on, but being a public servant, I knew was going to come knocking at some point. And, uh, Last year was the time. I, I want to follow up on that because you both were elected in 2021. Uh, Barry as acclamation, Brendan with 72% of the vote. We we found that out in our pre-interview. Um, why municipal politics? What was it about the desire for municipal politics for both of you? Because you could have chosen federal, you could have chosen provincial, but at the end of the day, you said, I want to give back to my community. And to do that, I'm going to choose municipal government. So Brendan, we'll start with you and then we'll go over to Barry on this one. Sure. Um, so I, I think from, from a very broad perspective, it's you can affect change uh, at a grassroots level. 
right? And we, we hear that term grassroots all the time. Municipalities are identified uh, by the province as creatures of the province. And we, we can really affect change on a day-to-day, -day, week to week, month to month basis uh, from a municipal level. I don't, I looked around the horizon, you know, federally, provincially, municipally, and I thought, where, where can I make the biggest difference? And starting in a community like Black Diamond, that's only uh, 2,700 people, um, your constituents' voices are, are loud. Um, you can't really, you don't, you choose, or you, you could choose to ignore them, but uh, they keep coming back. And so ultimately, if you're doing things properly, uh, like I believe we've done in the past year, people really rally behind you. And it was a really tough decision not to run in the same capacity as I did last year. But I knew that staying involved was just as important because at the end of the day, the mayor vote counts for one, as does a councillor. And so we both have the same voice in that room and it's really important to our constituents. So for me, starting at the bottom, understanding the needs of the creature uh, of the municipality, um, you know, who knows what the future will bring? Perhaps it's provincial or federal. Um, I don't see that right now, but I knew that understanding what a municipality needed to be successful was a critical piece in, in this experience. So that's why I started here. Barry, what about yourself? Why municipal politics? And was there, like uh, Brendan said, a desire to sort of have that grassroots governance that people sort of look at? You know what? The grassroots is exactly the term that you would use. Um, an interesting fact, and I'll, I'll let Ian speak to it later. I'm sure he'll bring it up somewhere along the way. But, you know, municipal politics, we're responsible for 80% of what you see and what you get at your door your water, your sewer, your road cleaning, your garbage, your cycling, uh, streets clean, grass cut, you know, you name it, it, it's right here. Whereas you go provincial and federal, that's outside the bubble. And once it gets outside the bubble, um, you have no control. So for me, the reason I got into politics, and this is gonna sound a little bit selfish, but uh, I did a five year uh, stint as a stay at home dad. Um, so when I had the kids at two and one, and I got to talking to all the other moms, you know, it was clear, like, there are things our community needs. And one of those things was a spray park, you know, to go with our pool. And so I fundraised $800,000 through our Lions Club um, to make that happen. And part of getting that parcel finished was I needed to go one step up the food chain to really make sure that this project got completed. And that was run for municipal politics to make sure that uh, the people are behind it get some budget money put to it, get some land allocated for it and get it built. And that's what we did. So um, that's where it started for me was just right in that simple uh, era of peeling off the old masculinity band-aid and uh, doing a stint as a stay-on dad. And it was life-changing. So since then, you know, it's, it's morphed into so many more things. And what I really look at is you know, I coach at the school doing basketball, for example, and just being a presence for teenagers um, and joking and joshing. And I mean, Brendan, being a teacher, he knows exactly what I'm talking about. You have the chance to influence the next generation and show them that this is no big deal. People are people and it's what you do, not what you say. It's what you do that matters. So show up, put up and get up and do it again make a difference in people's lives and things will happen. But if you sit back and talk about it, nothing happens. So to me, it's all about action. And uh, so we have a great program in both communities called the Snow Angel Program. Uh, so basically pick a couple seniors and go shovel or walk. So perfect. I drag my kids around every time it snows and they hate me for it. But one day they'll look back and say, yep, friggin' dad. <laughs> you know, so there you go. So while we could talk about duty to serve in municipal politics for a while, I want to get to the crux of this interview. And before I do that, I want to say that most of my line of questioning will be about from the residential standpoint. And I've, I've asked Ian to come on here because he's more of the strategic steps part of the municipal local government. So he's going to be asking a little bit more uh, technical questions while I ask more of the sort of overarching questions. But before we do that, I want to say that 
this journey starts back in 2007, from what I can understand. In 2007, both communities, the community of Turner Valley and Black Diamond, held a plebiscite. And if I'm not mistaken, Turner, Turner Valley said, yes, we want to amalgamate the two communities. Black Diamond said no. After a few years, in 2021, the two councils then decided in they were going to vote on this issue in September of amalgamation. And then the order of council from the provincial government of Alberta came down in May saying, yes, you can go ahead with your a new incorporated town of Black, or D sorry, Diamond Valley. I'm always going to get that wrong. I apologize yeah. right now. I want to ask this question to start off, and then I'm going to throw it to Ian here. This journey has come a long way. We are one month away from the new incorporated town. How has this journey been for both of you? Because, Brendan, you're new to this journey. Barry, you've kind of been here for the majority of this journey. So I'm going to start with Barry, then I'm going to go to Brendan, and then Ian, if you want to ask a question, go ahead. So Barry, go ahead. Okay, excellent. Well, I'll tell you what, Chris, uh, it started a lot sooner than 2007. Uh, we have uh, a history that goes back with the two towns from the gas plant being the main breadwinner of, uh, of the area uh, right back in 1914 as they came up through. 1988, they actually did a report. Uh, 95, they did another one. 2007 is the one you saw. And then 2017, I was on council as part of the uh, amalgamation study as well. So there's been a lot of money thrown at the, the concept of amalgamation um, for the last 50 years, we like to say, in these towns. And if you talk to any old timer, they'll say, hey, gee, we've been talking about that forever. It's never going to happen. Yeah, man, yeah. Right? You will. You'll get it. So when I moved here um, in 2007, <laughs> it was actually... I think we moved here in March, the following um, October was an election and there was a plebiscite question. And the plebiscite question at the time was very convoluted. Just ask us yes or no, right? But anyway, that aside, uh, at the time I said, it's silly that we're not amalgamated. So um, we're so alike. And I look at it through the lens of a volunteer base. When you go out volunteering, you don't look at, well, well, you're from that side of the river and I'm from this side of the river. You're there with a common heart and a common goal. You know, whether it be search and rescue or Lions Club or Kinsman, like I was saying earlier, um, you're doing something for the good of the people around you. And in every context, our communities are so tied at the hip, it just made sense. So in 2013, we had the, the great floods here in um, Southern Alberta. High River, of course, was all over national news. Well, you know, Turner Valley and Black Diamond were hit extremely hard by those floods wiping out seven of nine wells, water wells to our town and Black Diamond's entire water plant. So Turner Valley's water plant became the lifeblood and they basically ran a overland uh, hose right across the top of the uh, golf course uh, to the south and filled Black Diamond's water tower. And within 24 hours, the entire town was back on water. And of course, since then, you know, we're on the same water, we're on the same sewer, we're on the same uh, garbage pickup system. Uh, we're tied at the hip on all of our base levels. So really it was a matter of pulling the trigger and just saying enough of the talk, let's move on and get this done. So, um, so I've been privileged enough to be part of that process for the last nine years. And uh, I think it's a huge thing to, to be here at the end of what I like to call is the 50 year conversation. Brendan, what about yourself? You, you're relatively new to uh, municipal politics. You, well, your first elected position is as mayor of Black Diamond. How has it been this transition period? Because you were elected in uh, October. You don't find out if you're going to be amalgamated until May. So you're running for a four year job and then Six months into it, you get the word that your job is going to be non-existent at the end of the year. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot going on here, obviously, <laughs> for, um, especially as like teaching full time, um, obviously, is like what I do. Um, so the, the really nice thing about, well, I shouldn't say nice because it, it's been a little bit back and forth. But one of the bonuses to, um, to running 
was that if things didn't work out from a professional and personal standpoint for me, it would have been easy to stand back and say, listen, this is too much for me. I can let it go. So I had an idea that with amalgamation um, going ahead, because rate is rate leading up to the election last fall, the application had already been submitted. So for a lot of us as candidates, we thought, okay, we're going to jump into this and work through the final pieces of amalgamation. That it, it did not happen like that. So uh, we get elected and uh, I, I wrote some things down just so that I, that I don't miss anything. We get elected, the application's already been submitted. Then we get a, we have a conversation with the Minister of Municipal Affairs, Rick McIver, right before Christmas. Uh, I, was, I was away with my wife, we had something special planned. Here I'm zooming in from Vancouver to a call to discuss um, the, the amalgamation. And I'm like, this is a done deal. What are we talking about here? And so the minister takes away from that conversation that, you know what, maybe this isn't a done deal. So he comes back to us and he says, I'd like you guys to vote again. And I'm like, holy camoly. I, there's, I'm, I'm telling you, Chris, there's thousands of pages of documentation since this started. And I, I think to myself, okay, I could just wing this and just say, I, I'm all in, right? I'm just going to vote pro amalgamation. I'm not going to do any of my research, but I couldn't do that. So I started printing everything. I read through the application report, which was just shy of 500 pages. Uh, I went through all, all the service studies that were available, all the cost saving uh, measures that were put into place. And I did a lot of digging and I'm like, you know what? Is amalgamation good for us? Uh, ultimately I'm thinking, yeah, it is, but there's a lot of questions here that we still need answers to now. That's just part of my inexperience coming through because I don't have all that um, year to year knowledge that, that Mayor Crane has, right? He's been working through this process for almost a decade. So I rely on that experience when I made my final decision. I'm looking through the report I say, you know, there's a couple of question marks here. However, I know that a lot of people sitting on the Turner Valley Council are experienced. They understand what they're talking about. And so I, I used a lot of that information in my decision. Um, I don't know, uh, uh, had we decided as a council, cause our, the Turner Valley council voted seven, oh, seven, four, we voted four, three, four, four to three in favor. So it wasn't a unanimous decision and had one or two of us had decided that, you know what, maybe we do need some more information. The minister, sure. He still could have said, you know, I'm pushing the application through. I'm not sure exactly what his plan was or, you know, if he thought that this perhaps could have backfired if it had been 4-3 the opposite way. I think he would have found himself in a really tricky situation um, because ultimately the decision would have had to have been on him. Um, and if he had killed the application, we ultimately would have had to start back at square one. So there's a lot of back and forth pieces there. So I know that the benefits long term, you know, the three to five year, the five to 10 year benefits of amalgamation are there for our communities. Service levels, um, uh, fire departments, peace officers, RCMP detachments, all that stuff is there. It makes sense on paper. The one thing that I will mention is that for me, it wasn't a matter of if this was going to happen. It was a matter of when this was going to happen. Yeah. And currently the provincial government has some grants available for us to access. So once we complete these final steps in the next month, um, we're going to go to the province and say, look, here's our receipts. Um, how much of this are you going to cover for us? So we looked at that as taxpayers, but also as a municipality and said, if the government comes to us in five years and says, hey, you guys, guess what? You got to amalgamate, which is generally how it's been. This amalgamation is the first volunteered amalgamation in Alberta's history. There's a reason for that. A lot of communities aren't looking back and forth at one another saying, hey, you want to join teams? More times you have a big amalgam, a big municipality and a smaller one that's struggling. And the province says, hey, you guys help these guys out. We need you guys to come in, provide them services, snow removal, peace officer agreements. Um, we're not in that situation. So we wanted to make sure that we took advantage of those grants because at the end, that's going to save our taxpayers money. I'm going to jump in now, if I can. Uh, Mayor Crane, you, you said early on that this is kind of the end of a 50 year journey. And Mayor Kelly's talk about either yes or no, you ultimately make a binary decision through the proceeding or not. And at some point through that 50 years, 
the decision moved from no to maybe to yes. And you've kind of walked us through that a little bit. But in as much as this is the end of a 50-year journey, it's also the start of a 50-year journey as well. Mm -hmm. And you've gradually been, I mean, their, their water has been warming up in that pot. And all of a sudden, you've got to move through your transitional council into a brand new council, for the first council for the town of Diamond Valley. So, I mean, kind of with, with that in mind, what's, I'm interested in the differences. Some of the, some of the, some of it's practical, but kind of what's the vision of success that you have that's different for your amalgamated municipality than maybe you have as two closely associated communities too. And I don't know, Barry, if you want to take that one on. I think I can try. Um, <laughs> so, so some differences in how we're, we're juggling those. Well, man, again, I mean, I'm that optimist who's always looking at things we do together, right? Uh, but I, I gotta say, and Mayor Kelly, you know, he kind of really touched on it there that made me start thinking and, and jotting down, yeah, what, what's a few things here that we need to work on? Because uh, for the new set of eyes that he brought in uh, with the, the strong backing he had from the electric, um, he was put right into the hot pan uh, to say, you know, Black Diamond represent, you know. And for me, uh, I've been at it for a while. So you get lackadaisical after a while. So I kind of agree with the state sometimes the eight year principle on politicians, they should be out after eight um, because you should have new blood. Um, but anyway, our, our administrations, um, of course, and our councils, essentially right across the province do the same jobs. But every municipality does a little thing different. And that's what we're finding now, that difficulty you know, and it's no easy job. It's easy for us as politicians to say, we're going to put ourselves on the chopping block and we're going to lop off half mm -hmm. of our head and the money that goes with it for the greater good. Administrators are not so lucky to chop themselves up. And that's a reality. The other reality is we need all the bodies we have to get jobs done. But getting the service levels to, to coincide and finding out who's going to be uh, the interim CAO, for example, was a very difficult conversation. Then you get down into organizational charts and you start talking about uh, positions of power and management, you know, is it this side or that side. Those are difficult conversations. But in the end, um, what we really want to see is the efficiencies for our service delivery. And on that level, I think that we're very similar um, because over the years and some of the other documents even pointed out, you know, we should align um, foothills or, or FCSS funding, for example. Um, we should align our cat and animal bylaws so that our CPOs can interchange uh, direction if needed, right? If one's on call and one's not, uh, we can all use that. So aligning bylaws has been something that's been going on for about 10 years as well. Leading up to, as Mayor Kelly said, it's just a matter of when. So uh, for me, it's those little changes, but I think it's very hard on administration to, to make it through this process a lot less than it is for politicians uh, like myself. Before I let uh, Mayor Kelly respond, I'm, I'm intrigued by your comment around aligning bylaws. How do you mm -hmm. choose? Uh, you've, presumably you've aligned a lot of them already, as you've said. Is there going to be uh one set of bylaws that's adopted and another one or rescinded or will it be kind of hit and, hit and miss so right now what we've been doing is uh, both legislative services have been taking you know x and y bylaw sitting down cross-referencing highlighting the differences and then yeah. bringing those to our joint friendship agreement committee meetings which is um joint councils back in 2012 black diamond and turner valley council again kind of broke ground with intermunicipal collaboration and we created a joint council that sat down and said what can we do together to okay. save taxpayer money so bylaws was on that list capital spending was another one uh, but what i'd like to see to really make this easy on admin is once a new council is in present them two bylaws here's black diamonds here's turner's valleys read them pick one and then we can amend it over the next year and streamline it. Don't waste too much time, you know, into the weeds. Oh, well, this one, you know, for example, on our animal control, Turner Valley took care of cats, Black Diamond didn't. And so this huge debate about 
do we capture cats or don't we capture cats? <laughs> what do we do with the cats when we catch them and who takes care of them? Who feeds yeah. them? Oh my goodness. You know, it was, it was ridiculous. You had us all sitting around getting paid to talk about cats. So anyway, Turner Valley said, good, we'll take it out. We're done. <laughs> and now no cats. So if you have cats, let them run free. You know, that's it. Uh, right? Mayor Kelly, what was the, so I, was, I started this little rabbit hole, this kind of journey talking about kind of the next 50 years uh, looking yeah. back to got to what got you this spot this is obviously a bit of a uh singularity and at some point you come out the other side as this unified municipality it's all peace light and goodness i presume for the next 50 years yeah great point unified what a great word right because we're kind of we're kind of uh, bestowing that upon both both towns and saying hey you guys are now one town you're supposed to be friends um, you got the Hatfield and McCoy, perhaps, uh, you know, building on each side as well, because yeah. there's been a lot of families that have that have been there for over 50 years, too. Right. Yeah. So I, I've, I wrote some points down as, as Mayor Kane was talking there. So obviously, at the end of the day, one of the biggest thing here about is steady taxes. Right. So when, when it comes to aligning bylaws, when it comes to um, eliminating one council, one CAO, there's a lot of redundancies having to two towns, uh, especially when they're less than two kilometers away from one another. Um, so steady taxes is, is obviously what we, what we want to see. Um, obviously, the biggest question that we get, especially because we're in election time right now, is are my taxes going to go down? Well, let's just take a look nationally at where we are with inflation and all those other contributing factors. We've got the war in Ukraine uh, and Russia going on. We've got uh, supply chain issues that we're still kind of dealing with since COVID. So those types of things, um, municipalities aren't going to figure out. Uh, you know, we're just going to continue to provide the services that we can for our residents. What we can do, though, through aligning all these things is if we're able to kind of lower how much money we're spending on services throughout time, you know, conceivably the next couple of years, we will have steady taxes while conceivably the rest of Alberta and probably the majority of Canada are dealing with large hikes, whether that's water hikes, um, property value hikes, all those factors. We're hoping that if we can eliminate half a million dollars, excuse my school bell, uh, if we can eliminate half a million dollars in redundancies, we can put that money into the services. So um, for instance, we repaved two roads this summer and it was estimated just around 300 or $3 million, but it came in at 30% over because of inflation. That obviously came out of reserves and was passed on at some point to our taxpayers. So if we're able to eliminate $500,000, and that's just a theoretical number, um, our taxpayers won't necessarily see that sticker shock because we can say, well, hold on a sec. It did cost an extra $75,000. However, we saved X amount of dollars this year. Instead of passing it on to our taxpayers um, by decreasing their taxes, let's leave taxes where they are. And then that way we can still uh, fix the things that we want to fix without having to go door knocking on doors saying, hey, we need a little bit more money to fix your road because X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the big things. Um, I wanted to quickly touch on Barry's after eight thing because I'm only 35. And if I'm out of politics by the time I'm 43, it doesn't really give me a good long-term uh, standing here in the community. So I'm, I just wanted to note that, um, that I'm getting involved early so that I do have some experience by the time I'm 45, 50 years old. Um, it just so happened that I ran for mayor at, instead of council. So here we are. That was just one thing. So efficiencies I already talked, uh, I talked about, um, and Barry did a good job too. When we talk about aligning bylaws, ultimately um, each town has very capable staff. And no one bylaw is quote unquote better than the other, but we just need to pick the one that works for both communities and then we can amend it. There's no, there's no point in trying to rewrite bylaws. We have two bylaws that work in each town. We will have to, to circle back to one of the kind of contentious ones is um, our trailer bylaw. <laughs> That'll be a really fun thing to talk about because we just instituted a bylaw to like right when I got elected. It was like, no one can have trailers at their house. And it, everyone's like, what the hell, man? Like, I want to be able to park my trailer on my property. It's like super Alberta, right? Like, Berta, like want to park my stuff on my lawn. And I'm like, all right, I hear you. But we're, we're, we've already moved on with this. It was already decided. 
But now that we're going back to the table, everyone's kind of like, Hey, what about my trailer? Can I park my trailer here again? And I'm like, I don't know. That's, that's going to be one of those council of the day discussions, but it's a very real discussion that we have to have because it was something that black diamond council kind of glossed over um, a couple of years ago. And I don't think that proper consultation was done in the community, but that's just one kind of outlier. Um, everything else, just pick the best ones, uh, amend it if you have to and, and move on. You picked some cats and trailers. I love that. So right? oh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you one quick story here, Ian, cause I told one of my buddies, we had it, we had some, some, uh, some students or teenagers doing burnouts on one of our, our, um, gravel parking lots. Right. So someone says, Hey, let's just put some rocks up, right? That'll deter them. Well, it did until it snowed. And then parents are driving into said rocks and we're like, Oh, we got to get those rocks out of there. And my buddies are like, man, that has got to be one of the most municipally uh, directed conversations that I've ever heard. You guys are talking about, he's like, who paid for those rocks? I'm like, buddy, I'm not even getting into the thick of this. Okay? But those are just the things that we deal with. And, and the great thing is, is we can actually change things. Those rocks were removed the next day. If that was something in Calgary, those rocks would be there for two years and it'd be going through the court system before anyone ever did anything about it, right? <laughs> go, we got to wait and see what the judge says. We, we no comment on this. We can affect real change at our level. Amen. I, I want to go back to a comment that uh, uh, Mayor Kelly uh, talked about just recently here. It's about the Hatfields and McCoys. Um, you two, you are two separate idea, uh, towns. You have Turner Valley and you have Black Diamond. On January 1st, you are hoping that all your residents will forego their idea of what their community is and start a new community of Diamond Valley. Identity is a really big thing in small towns. They believe that they are their community. They are Turner Valley. They are Black Diamond. How do you see your roles into the next month as you prepare for this big changeover to get people out of the mindset of, we're no longer the town we were. We're this new town with our, the McCoys down the road or the Hatfields up the street from us. How do you see yourselves in this new amalgamated town working with your residents to make them understand and make them realize that this is for the better of all of us and not just one. And I feel like uh, Mayor Crane is pointing at uh, Mayor Kelly here. So Mayor Kelly, you want to take this one first? <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I'll take it first. Um, it, it's a great question. And um, one of the things that we're trying to do through the rebranding um, of the town is to honor the past, but commit to the future. And that's something that we're trying to instill in our council and our administration. Things have really been coming at us at light speed. Um, as much as we'd like to say we need more time, can we postpone this? Can we do this later? Um, it's inevitable that we need to make a decision. And sometimes we just have to make the best decision we can with the information that we have available. And uh, what resonates really with our residents is, is money. And, and what can they get for the taxes that they pay in their community? Uh, and so we need to make sure that as we transition from two distinct towns, with very unique identities that we are somehow enabled to, um, to place those. Maybe it's in the logo, maybe it's in our kind of catchphrase uh, that people remember us by. Um, maybe it's things that we put up in the town, like in front of the uh, Black Diamond office. We, we're Black Diamond. We have a huge Black Diamond that is bigger than a minivan uh, that sits out of our town office. I don't want that to go anywhere. I want that to stay there. I want our residents to remember who they were. Um, but again, it, it, it's important that um, I don't know if, if we would have had the choice in five or 10 years. I think the province, like I said earlier in, the, in my answer, the province was going to come knocking at some point because their job is also to look for efficiencies. And the province at some point would have said, look, you guys just share too many things and it doesn't make any sense that you both have such high tax rates and you deliver the exact same services. But if we look over at Didsbury or another community that has the same amount of population that has the same tax bracket, they're able to achieve a lot more. Why? It comes down to administration. It comes down to the type, the amount of managers we have. And that's where we need to find that. So 
the message to our residents is, look, we're not trying to get rid of Black Diamond. We're not trying to get rid of Turner Valley. The, the oil and gas plant that's in Turner Valley, the province isn't just going to come in and take it and, and say, look, we know this was the first one in, in Alberta. You know, you guys don't deserve it anymore. We're still going to honor those icons that we have. And I think that's what's really important. Those are the pieces that our residents need to know are going to stick around. The name is just a name at the end of the day. The two communities are still going to be there in some capacity. So for Mayor Crane, because you both, both gentlemen are currently out on the campaign trail. This episode is airing the Friday before election day. So you guys are both out on the campaign trail. And this is from more of a residential perspective that this question is going to be posed to you, Mayor Crane. And I don't want to have to drive to Black Diamond to pay my taxes. And I don't want to be in Black Diamond and have to drive to Turner Valley to pay my taxes. And that's where residents come into play here because while you're looking at this from an administration standpoint, as a political standpoint, residents are going, okay, how is this going to affect where I have to pay my taxes? Or am I going to have to go to City Hall in a, two kilometers away compared to where I was doing it already? So when you're out on the campaign trail right now, is that a question that's coming up? Or are they just saying, like you said earlier on in the conversation, let's just get it over with. Like it's uh, enough talk and let's just, let's play the game and move forward in a, an appropriate fashion. And let's just get over the, the hump of where everything's going to lay. Yeah, uh, great question, Chris. Uh, I'll, I'll blend it right into the, uh, the question on our culture and our identity, uh, if that works. Uh, obviously, a lot of people, I mean, amalgamation has been talked about for so long. And because we brought it up now, COVID was an interesting time to actually work this process. And I think that needs to be addressed for sure, because we had always planned from 2017, everyone ran on a platform uh, of moving amalgamation forward. So once we got into 2019, Black Diamond had just finished a process of annexation um, with the uh, province and the uh, surrounding MD. You can't run an amalgamation while an annexation is happening, but you have to have annexation in order for the borders to touch to make amalgamation happen. So they had to put it in COG A, and then we could run up on COG B. So in the last two years of that term, we really pushed hard uh, to get amalgamation over the uh, threshold. Of course, COVID hit 2020. Public engagement became very difficult. So everywhere you went, you had to insert the conversation. But that also led up to our identity. Because we were cut off from everyone and every community was doing their own thing, you know, the fact that we have one uh, grocery store in Black Diamond at AG Foods makes a big difference because that's a gathering place, right? Uh, our Sheep River Library as many uh, possible programs as they could put off, which is the intermunicipal library. It'll become just the library um, when we amalgamate. But, you know, that became a community hub. Our sports associations and all the coaches and whatever they could do to keep kids busy, you know, they worked out all their problems. And that was buy-in. That was all buy-in to, we don't care uh, what we have to do. We want families and we want kids and we want our seniors to have something to do through this COVID. That was a really gelling point for our community and that created uh, a great sense of culture. Not only that, I referenced it earlier, the 2013 floods was to me a defining moment to really show that there is no difference across the board here. We are all in this together the water plant services us all, the sewer plant uh, services us all, everything is tied together for these two communities. So um, our identity, I think, is extremely strong out here. And we attract people out of Calgary. Um, and when they come out, they, they literally feel the tension leave their body as they hit the cowboy trail. And they come through our towns. Uh, Turner Valley has a, a unique history with the gas plant, but we also have uh, internationally gold-winning Eau Claire distilleries and Far Brewery. So we have this day trip kind of uh, sensation going on in Chuck Wagon Cafe. And then they turn the corner and they hit Black Diamond, which has this extremely cool downtown feel uh, with little shops and the Blue Rock Gallery. Uh, and it has its own entity as well, but put them together and you have this eclectic sensation for day trippers out of Calgary where they just come back week after week and then they move here so 
We've got people moving here all the time. Houses have been selling like hotcakes and we can't keep enough of them building. So, um, Could yeah. I interject for one sec? Yeah, yeah but I'm just going to, I'm going to interject one sec. Before the sure. towns actually do amalgamate, I'm making a pledge to go down and actually visit both your communities. So at least I could say I have stepped foot in Black Diamond and Turner Valley one time before they no longer exist. But uh, yes, go, go uh, Mayor Kelly and then Ian, if you want to ask so a question. All, all, I, all I wanted to say, because because your point or your question was about having the town office, which has been designated in Black oh, Diamond. Yeah. So our, our town office is, or for both towns is gonna to be in Black Diamond. The point I wanted to make right now is that the library, the pool, the splash park, they're all in Turner Valley. We don't have any of those in Black Diamond. The arena, the high school and the grocery store are in Black Diamond. So for a resident to say, oh man, I don't wanna go over there to go pay my taxes or, hey man, like I gotta to go to the town office, it's all the way in Black Diamond. There's already so many shared resources that this is just, all we're doing, again, it comes down to cost saving. We have two town offices. You eliminate one of those. The, the property value that the town office of Turner Valley is on, if we chose to sell it or reuse it in some capacity, rent it out, money. It's money. It's great. Yeah. So I just wanted to address that. We already share a ton of stuff. True, true. And so I will jump in and I'll just say, Chris, I'm heading down that way in a month. I'll, I'll pick you up on the way through and you can, you can have lunch at the truck wagon while we're there. Tell us when you come, we'll join you. Yeah. Great. Okay. So the, the question I have for you is more of a legacy question. Um, you mentioned earlier on, I think, Mayor Crane, that this is maybe the only uh, example in recent memory of two collegial partners getting together and deciding that they can be better if they work together versus the typical uh, typical experience of one municipality taking over another experience, another municipality through amalgamation or dissolution or something. There are other municipalities, of course, who are humming and hawing about this and who knows what the province is going to do. I wonder, because you've probably made all the mistakes and you've probably figured out the best way to do it, things that work and things that don't, if you have any advice for communities which may be considering a similar path to the one you're currently on. Yeah, that's an easy, like you're hitting things right there. Like, it's a great question. It, it, it's important to note, right? that there are definitely lots of learnings uh, coming through this system. And the first one that we can talk about right now is if you're really getting serious about doing this, uh, don't waste so much money on the study, 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 studies, right? We did four studies over the years. If you know that in the future, you're gonna to be touching as a landmass, then that conversation needs to start today. The ICFs that the province implemented a few years back, the Intermunicipal Collaboration Frameworks, are essentially based off of the friendship uh, agreement that we presently use and we started in 2012 under Mayor Tuck. Um, but anyway, my point is this. What I would suggest, the most important thing you could do is get an HR firm in to have conversations about what does it really look like? That, that way you're not setting off alarm bells, you're not pissing people off, if I could say piss off people, um, but it gives the councils an idea of what it would really look like. Then you have something tangible that you can say, okay, we can see there's savings here, we can see there's alignment here. And something for me that really makes amalgamation important, um, and it, it's probably one of the strongest points that people don't talk about, is the alignment of decision making. So presently, you know, two councils sit down, we have an 80% voting model. We have to sell everybody in the room in order to make a decision to move the communities forward if we wanted to do something. Once you have that one council, your conversations are streamlined, your public engagement is streamlined, and your decision making is streamlined. So you can actually get things going in the ground. If you need to make decisions, get something built, you're not waiting for, well, hold on now, we should probably go and have some consideration here and talk to our partners over there. And then we should probably talk to our other partners, you know, and that's where you get laughed at as a municipal politician because you're just talking for six months when it was easier just to take the shovel, go out and do it. Or as Mayor Kelly said, just take the truck, get the rocks out of there, we're done. Mayor Kelly, any advice from you? Oh man. Yeah. I, I really had, uh, 
I really had a lot of things to talk about um, with the application that was submitted to the minister. Um, came up with, I think, 19 questions. And most of those were for myself, but also for the residents, clearing up things like uh, one of the biggest misconceptions that we had had to do with addresses. And so some of those little pieces where the residents, you know, you don't, you don't want to say no to amalgamation because you're, you need to go get a new driver's license. Um, and, and that's kind of what, those are the questions that we get. People don't want to go and re-register um, all their trailers and their trucks and their quads and their skidoos and everything. It, it's cumbersome. It takes time out of their life. Um, and it's more of an inconvenience. So some of those um, links between the province and the municipality, I know that we're going to uncover a lot of, uh, a lot of things that are going to make that easier on future municipalities. Should they, should they go this way? There's not really, you know, hindsight is always 2020. And it's easy for us to stay, sit here and say, man, I wish we had done this or I wish we had asked for that. Um, and uh, I think until truly, until the process is through, uh, I, I'm going to leave it at that because I don't want to muddy the waters for anybody else um, because all municipalities are unique. And uh, we have a river that comes right through ours and Barry has talked about that. There's other municipalities that, that aren't affected by water uh, or they're not affected by um, you know, garbage removal or any of those things. So the really, the really cool and unique thing about this is that every municipality in that and this type of amalgamation, they're going to come about their own problems. And it's just going to be having really level-headed councils that sit down. And one of those really important things that Barry talked about was the 80%. We have had real discussions where we have uh, 13 people sitting at the table and 10, and 10 vote in favor, but three vote against, it doesn't pass. So we need to be really constructive. We really, we really need to make sure that the motions that we propose are clear and directive and that we get buy-in from everybody. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Great point. Ian, do you have a follow-up question? Because you'll have one that's, last that's question. That's great. I think we're... Go ahead, continue. So we're going to see more and more of this, I think. So you have finding the lived experience of those people who have actually been through it certainly has some uh, some value to others who may be approaching it. So thank you both. Barry and I are going to have to start a book <laughs> and it's going to be a bestseller in Canada. Uh, <laughs> like the two communities that amalgamated and it, I'll be able to retire on it. I'm sure. no. Clearly, <laughs> obviously. Being a Canadian book writer is a marvelous way to riches. So, <laughs> yes. cool. uh, yeah. I there's, there's lots of, uh, there's lots of pros and cons. And uh, I think once it's all said and done, there's still some more learning to go for the sure. new council in the first year of amalgamation. Uh, there's going to be a lot of decisions really fast. And I think that's going to be another learning experience. So I'm really hoping that uh, myself and uh, Mayor Kelly are on that new council and that we get a chance to uh, live that experience as it were. Yeah. And um, yeah, just keep the change coming and uh, make it happen. So. Thanks. So I want to end on this question and it's going to be a kind of a poignant question. I do apologize if I hit you right in the gut here, guys, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Giving up power like a mayor's chair is quite hard. You are both up for election and you do not know what this election is going to be on Monday because this is being recorded and airing before election day. Um, if you could look back on your time as mayor as an elected official and say, even if I don't get elected on Monday and I'm not on that new council, I did the best thing for my community. Would you be able to say that? And if so, why? I'll go first, Barry, if you want. Sure. Because my, my tenure has been a little bit shorter. It's a little bit, you know, um, to be blunt, uh, not only do I believe that uh, I have done everything that I that I thought I could um, because of the support from administration and the support from my own council. I think we've actually done more uh, than than we really initially sought out to to do. Um, and what I mean by more is that uh, public engagement, um, uh, extinguishing misinformation, and that was uh, you alluded earlier, Chris, to the 2007 plebiscite. There was so much misinformation in the community when that plebiscite was delivered that Black Diamond said no. And they said no quite resounding. Like the, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it wasn't like a 60-40 split. It was quite higher than that. 
Um, and so when I ran, I had a real clear focus, communication, transparency, and small businesses. My three things this year are communication, small businesses, and sustainable growth. Um, transparency is still there, but communication and transparency, I, I believe my constituents know that I'm already transparent with them. I just need to communicate everything with them as best I can. Um, so I believe that uh, I, I have done a lot um, besides the personal sacrifices, you know, missing family time, late night meetings, all those things that I wasn't prepared for necessarily. Um, I didn't shy away from those things. And I know that I left absolutely everything on the table. And I was speaking with my deputy mayor this morning. Last week was easily the busiest week that I've had since being elected. We had the public forum on Monday, um, uh, rebranding on Tuesday, regular meeting on Wednesday, um, uh, HR meeting on Thursday, <sighs> Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I had public engagements. Uh, I was flat out last week. And I got a little bit burnt out, a little bit sick, but I don't let that stuff slow me down. You take enough Tylenol or cold medicine, you're good to go. Um, so yes, I believe that I've done everything that I could. I, I, I believe from the emails, uh, I've received quite a few emails from residents and groups saying, man, I wish you'd run for mayor. Uh, we really want you at the helm. Um, but to be completely honest, even though Barry, even if Barry wasn't sitting here, I believe in Barry. Um, I wouldn't have stepped aside had I not believed in Barry. I know that we have very similar um, uh, objectives. We both believe in our community. And at the end of the day, running against Barry and having one of us gone was not the answer for me. Stepping aside, running for council, holding Barry accountable uh, was far more important when it comes to representing my community. Because like I said, council order gets one vote, the mayor gets one vote. So I know that I'm going to be just as instrumental in the new, the, the new community. Great answer. Um, and, and that's totally true. He's younger and better looking. So, I mean, I would have had my work cut out for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, to, to just follow up on that, it, it's totally true. Um, you know, this new community is better served if we have both of us there. Now that's of course me being a little bit cocky that I'm going to win this election. But you don't run thinking you're going to lose. Nobody does. Right. So I'm going to say, come Monday, I'm going to win this thing. Uh, and I hope that uh, Mayor Kelly is right there by my side. So, um, but uh, what is the question? The question is, it, 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 even if you don't win, do you feel oh, like yes. you'd look back on your time and say, I did what I needed to for the community? Because as an elected official, you always want to put your community first. You never want to do it for power or greed. You want to do it for your community. Could you say if you walked away on Tuesday morning saying, I did it for the right reasons? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in 2013, I came in, uh, my focus was kids right? Because my kids were small. So my focus was all kid-based. It was mommy and me programs, library programs, building a spray park. Uh, when those finished and they got a little bigger, it was sports for kids, right? Let's get that moving. Um, now, it just so happened that it coincided my first year was the flood. So I got to see what the real municipality works at. I thought it was a lot of fluff prior to that but then I saw no there's a lot of real real actionable items that uh, that go into municipal politics so it was a big eye-opener and you know uh, I had the luxury of sitting at a table with people that were on council at that time for uh, nine and 12 years of experience so I was really I was the only new guy sitting on these very experienced councils so I got to sit back and really watch and learn for my entire first year um, and that was a godsend. I think that mentorship in the uh, mayor's role and council role is something that we lack right across the province. Um, but that's another story. Uh, so, so what did I do in nine years? I, I do feel that it was uh, really great. You know, um, in the last term, getting amalgamation, getting these conversations to this point after listening to the old guys, it'll never happen. Well, never is just a word. It's just a matter of, do we have the will? And when you look at the finality of the amalgamation and was it going to happen somewhere in the future? Sure it was. So as Mayor Kelly said, one of his platform items, planning. 
to me, planning is the most important thing we can do for our community and not just a little bit. Real planning, our MDPR municipal development uh, plans have to be on par for the long term, not the short term. You can do little tiny developments here and there on a little two acre parcel that won't affect a lot. But when you're looking at 80 uh, to 300 acre parcels of land and development, like you see the sprawl around Calgary, you better plan that absolutely beautifully. You better plan it for growth. You better plan it for the right families to come in there. You better have churches and shopping and schools. Everything needs to have uh, its place. And green space is one of those cogs that is an absolute must in new communities. And we have the luxury of having perfect examples in Okotoks and Cochrane, who are some of the top 10 in the world, or not the world, sorry, country, uh, for green space usage. So why would we reinvent the wheel? We combined, we have more land, we can then plan effectively, we have a river running through us, we have mountains on our back, we have all the accessories of Kananaskis at our fingertips. So a well-planned community here now will create that strong business, that strong resident uh, buy-in, and hopefully we stabilize taxes. We won't be lowering, but if we can stabilize, that's a big win. So I look at the 15 to 20 year mark here um, as, as our way to go. But for the time I served, if I were to be voted out on Monday, I would walk away, head held high. I set a good example for youth. I set a good example for myself and my family. And uh, I'd take that experience and maybe, I don't know, I'd go bug Ian McCormick for a job in <laughs> consulting. I, I see no downside to that, my friend. There's no all. downside. Yeah, oh. no, it's been a pleasure. And I, I hope to serve some more. One stupid question that I wanted to ask, but I didn't want to seem this stupid, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because I know we're at the hour mark, but I want to put this in here. Why just the two? Why Turner Valley and Black Diamond? Because why couldn't you have just amalgamated it with Foothills County? And say, why not just in, amalgamate with everyone? Like, don't get me wrong. Like, it seems like a very simple idea because it's two towns and you're not going into a county. It's two communities that are so close together. Was there ever a discussion that we'd go into Foothills County? No. Okay. No. Okay. There's, a, there's a, lot of, a lot of moving pieces there, Chris. See, yeah. this is why I asked the stupid question at the end. So hopefully everyone's <laughs> not listening now. <laughs> no, it wasn't a stupid question. It's, it's a good question. It's just there's too many moving pieces at this time. Um, but so, that, with, oh, go ahead. If I could, that being said, the new community of Diamond Valley is going to look to the county of Foothills as an absolute partner in everything we do. Yeah. Um, seniors housing, recreation, uh, traffic, transportation, uh, everything they are going to be our number one partner because right now we've been our number one partners. And once we combine, we need a new partner. And luckily we've built great relationships with uh, the County and we really look forward to, uh, to having those discussions. So with that, I want to thank both uh, mayor crane, mayor Kelly, Ian for coming in, sitting down and talking about the new community of Diamond Valley. But I also want to say to the people who are listening in both of your communities and the new community of Diamond Valley, election day is Monday. Get out and vote. If you don't vote, you don't have the right to complain about what these two men, if they're elected, uh, do with your tax dollars. So go out and vote. Uh, I believe uh, the voting stations are at the t town halls for both of your communities. Correct, men? High school for Black Diamond. Is it the Flair and Derek for you guys, Mayor Crane? Flair and Derek, yep. There you go. So you heard it from the mayors themselves. Go out and vote. Highly recommend it. Um, but also, in one year's time, I want to sit down with both of you because I can imagine you guys will have some stories to tell in one year's Ooh. time after this amalgamation process happens. So November 2023, let's have a follow-up conversation. So with that... I want to thank everyone for tuning in for another great edition of the Cross Border Interviews. I want to thank Ian McCormick for sitting down as my co-host for this episode. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, Mayor Kelly, Mayor Crane, greatly appreciate it. And as I say at the end of all my interviews, put down social media, put down Twitter, put down Facebook, put down TikTok and whatever you use today, young kids, and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, it helps our democracy, and it helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, Everyone, keep talking.